This is State Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. <laughs> Aloha and welcome to Hawaii Together. I'm Kei'i Akina, and you're on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Although I'm a trustee in the Office of Hawaiian Affairs and the president of the Grassroot Institute, the views that I express and my guest expresses today are purely our own and don't represent any organization necessarily. Today, my guest is Ray Tsuchiyama. He's a creative innovation specialist, uh, leader, consultant. I, I really don't know what to call him because his resume is so long and so diverse. But one thing he does is dream about what Hawaii could be. He comes from a perspective that gives him the tools and the intellectual capacity to dream big with global perspectives, even the universal perspectives in mind. I love talking with him because when we talk, we're able to look at not what we are, but what we could become. We're able to look not only at the things that challenge Hawaii, but the solutions to those challenges. And that's what we're going to talk about today. What can Hawaii learn from Google? Our purpose is not so much to talk about Google nor raise time at Google, but really to use that as a catalyst for saying, what if we thought differently about how we do business, how we run the government, how we solve the problems facing us on the social scene, everything from homelessness through educational needs and so forth. What if we did it the way Google does it? Now, that's not to say that Google has all the answers. In fact, Google would have to come here and be here in order to learn what we know, and even delve into our history, which Ray has done quite a bit in terms of Hawaiian history. But let's get on with the conversation. It's going to be spontaneous and fun. Ray Tsuchiyama runs a business that consults corporations on the subject of how to be innovative. My guest today, Ray Tsuchiyama. Ray, aloha. Welcome. Aloha. Great to be here. It's Ray. always good to talk with you. In fact, as you know, I really didn't do any prep with you in advance. <laughs> I said, show up. <laughs> we were going to oh. talk because you come with brilliance all the time. No, 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 no. And, and um, I'm really delighted to be here. And I did spend uh, about a year at Google uh, in Tokyo at Mountain View headquarters and really gained insights. Unfortunately, what uh, kind of uh, cut short that time was the great earthquake of March 2011 That's in right. Japan. And that triggered our departure from Japan. And you've had some pretty heavy hitting credentials as well, including a, a leadership role at MIT. When That's it comes right. To technology. Uh, I, I ran the Asia office for the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, did a lot of corporate relations research management with companies like Sony, uh, Panasonic, uh, Fujitsu, Toyota, many others. Asia factors so much into our thinking about the future of Hawaii, especially with the tilt from the, the Atlantic to the Pacific. I was on the phone just a, an hour before you and I met today in the studio talking to a colleague in, in Beijing, and, and we were discussing, actually, she was actually criticizing me for being an American who believes in the free market principles, <laughs> <laughs> bragging about cities like Shenzhen that used right. to be fish ponds and now today are masters of technology. Or uh, here's a, a very personal jab. She said, it, where she lives in Chengdu, yeah, are you right? they, they, they just finished a rail system for a multi-million population in a year and a half <laughs> at less than the cost that we plan to spend <laughs> here in the city and county of Honolulu. Ouch! <laughs> right. and, and Chengdu is not a, a big city like a Shanghai or Beijing. It's out in Sichuan, as That's you know. Right. She suggested <laughs> that we there. subcontract our rail work to them. <laughs> now, now, here's my point in all of this. Is she right that China is so far ahead of us in terms of technology and its innovation and application to everyday problems that we really have to be afraid in Hawaii and the United States? That's what she told me. Well, uh, during the last uh, 30 years, they've done uh, tremendous things. Uh, and remember, it all started uh, in the late, uh, early 80s. Uh, and uh, I remember uh, Deng Xiaoping looking at uh, right. uh, 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 what is now Pudong uh, or Shenzhen. Uh, Shenzhen, and, uh, yes, yeah. right across and, from and, Hong Kong. Yeah, right across from Hong Kong and, and saying, you know, this will be the uh, ma you know, centerpiece of our new economy. And it was duck farms, it was rice farms, it was communes, and you're absolutely right. But what, what are the bases uh, for the foundations for their growth? Uh, first of all, they have a very good public school system. Uh, and focus on uh, math, uh, even English. They, they have a very good English language program uh, and sciences. Uh, they have excellent uh, universities like Fudan, uh, Beijing University, uh, Jiao Tong, uh, uh, technical universities. Uh, and also uh, they had 
a lot of state enterprises that convert it to uh, private enterprises. That's now I'm going to just one. stop yeah. you there for a moment because as you continue to go down your list, yeah. the resources you're talking about seem rather industrial age That's oriented. That's right, yes. Even education, education not so much for creativity or thinking about ideas and so forth, but rather being technically proficient to fill certain roles, uh, industrial resources and so forth. Is that enough? Uh, is there something to their growth that will be hindered by perhaps the, the lack of freedom that we have in our country? Lack of uh, freedom in their country or our in our country? <laughs> in, I mean, in, the lack in, of freedom in their country. In, in, in China. That's, that's a very interesting uh, question because uh, that question even appeared in Japan, which is a capitalist country. You know, right. Are the Japanese creative? Um, and this goes back to the 80s and, and uh, during the bubble years. And of course, after uh, early, uh, early 90s, uh, the Japanese economy kind of de declined in the world. And we don't hear about Japanese management. Uh, and you're correct. We don't hear about uh, a, a, a Chinese um, equivalent to apples and so forth. But there are uh, firms coming up like Alibaba in e e-commerce, right. uh, like uh, uh, Lenovo in, in uh, laptops. Uh, which JD. Can, uh, com. Yeah, uh, uh, right. And uh, there are uh, Xiaomi, which is a handset company that's uh, really uh, coming emerging. But they did a lot of work uh, as ODMs or making uh, consumer items uh, for like TVs and uh, handsets right. and uh, all kinds for American and Japanese uh, companies. And they, uh, they haven't really made that uh, next leap into their own products. Now, there's a certain fascination the Chinese have, of course, with Google. Even Alibaba is trying to become a Google. What is it that they admire about Google? Well, the ability to really uh, create new products um, and make them really technically um, uh, excellent uh, for a global market, like uh, search, like uh, the maps, uh, Google, uh, Google Maps, and uh, coming out of nowhere uh, with Android, a completely new uh, operating system for handsets that now is number two to the iPhone. So they were able to do things uh, to bring products to the market, global market, in a very accelerated way. In fact, you've come up with an analysis of some of the key factors in Google that caused them to be successful even over their peers in the United States. But before we jump into that, let, let's look at that si situation I described when we opened up, Honolulu's traffic, the Honolulu rail system. Uh, Ten years ago or so, people began to say, we've got to do something about this terrible traffic and came up with a plan to create a mass transit rail system. And you've seen where that's gone. It's gone from a, an initial estimate of $2.7 billion. Now we're not even halfway through and it's exceeding $10 billion. It's uh, troubled with all kinds of political problems and so forth. I, I'm not here today to criticize the rail system, but what if we had gone back and thought like Google did? Would we have a different solution possibly today? How might Google have approached the problem 10 years ago of Hawaii's future traffic needs? That's a, that's a very fascinating question because I think they would look at uh, the consumers first. You know, how does one drive? You know, how, how does one get to a place? You know, where are you going? How do you go with uh, uh, to a place and, and why, the reasons why. I mean, uh, really looking at the motivations and, and uh, uh, all kinds of engineering tasks surrounding travel. What would, is travel? Would they have taken into account the fact that consumers increasingly want to create their own menus, want to have their own apps on an iPhone and so forth? They want to be able to be customize their entire experience, whether it's at restaurants, hotels, taxis and so forth, would that have been part of the thinking? Well, I think so. I think so. And so that's I, very, very different from putting them into a big box uh, <laughs> with 50 people in a box and taking them in one direction. Right. But I, I think they would also look at um, uh, where people live and okay. where people work. That's two, and where people shop. There are three uh, things that you do in one day. And, and there's a series of stops you do uh, in order to accomplish tasks, you know, what, what you want to uh, 
do for shopping, where do you have to go to sit in an office or not in an office or maybe at home. And, and uh, there's changes, I think, dramatic changes. Well, that's uh, fascinating. You know, how do you, uh, why do you travel? You know, why do you get out of your uh, house and go someplace? And uh, what are the uh, routes that you take? So the paradigm wouldn't have been, this is the most feasible route to lay the steel on and put everyone onto and get them there and get them back. Instead, they'd look at first, where do people start? Where do they play? Where do they eat? Where do they work? Where do they recreate? And how do we connect them to those points? That's exactly right. And in fact, the stations, um, if I was planning it, I'm a, I'm a real mass transit advocate. I, I was on mass transit every day in Japan, for example. And so the stations themselves must become like micro destinations. One station is where you live. Another station is where you work. Another station is shop. All you do is go <laughs> among the stations, right? <laughs> you, don't, you don't go anywhere else. So, so that kind of forces you to kind of uh, live out your life uh, oh, that's right. on, a, on, a, on a line. Forgive me for you going back to the metaphor of the, the iPhone, right. which is Apple. <laughs> <laughs> but there are also Google versions there. It's as if uh, you'd start with the consumer having control over all of the destinations, right. and that would design the experience. Now, now let's take a look at the, the big bulky cars that we have, the rail cars and so forth. Isn't Google uh, leading the world in terms of coming up with an autonomous car technology, the cars that use the data that it comes from our global positioning satellites? and virtually drive themselves? That's absolutely right, but you have to look back uh, uh, before the car itself, what will make it efficient? AI, artificial intelligence. I think that's the application of artificial intelligence on uh, the roots and how what human beings do and give a, a, a much more rational way of conducting your you know journeys through uh, every day. I think that's where you start out. Now, f for all of our viewers, would you define for a moment uh, in very practical terms what artificial intelligence is? It is a way to really um, understand um, uh, at a higher level uh, how people think. <laughs> and, and how people uh, communicate, how people map out their existence in the world. And uh, if you can apply uh, rules or algorithms that uh, computers will make uh, quickly and, and give results and outcomes, then you have a series of answers to where, what are the best routes for uh, transit or whatever in a city. So that's a, a higher level of intelligence uh, in a very short number of time, uh, amount of time that you can uh, output out results that you can apply to designing systems. So artificial intelligence could create a network and really be the brain that could allow a consumer to get into a shared vehicle that drives itself, and goes where they want, keeps pace with other vehicles, and perhaps matches the pace of other vehicles so well that really with a few number of vehicles you could actually go very, very quickly, get people to where they want to go, and solve the transportation problem. And, and you're coming to an interesting uh, uh, point. I don't think it's just technology itself. I think it's all about customer service. Uber does not own any taxis. Uh, Facebook does not have any content. Uh, Airbnb does not own any hotels. But when you look at these uh, apps and so forth, it's about making life a lot more happier, more efficient, and more choices that so you can driven choose. by the customer need. The customer I, I think that's, that's, that's the root, uh, uh, root in, in anything uh, that's very highly successful. What makes an app sticky, you return over and over and over again to do. And, um, and that, that's how um, uh, companies really understand. That's why Facebook and um, Google and others are trying to understand what your interests are. You know, so it's what are you going to buy? Antithesis yeah. of this, the phrase, if you build it, they will come which seems to be touted quite a bit in terms of our rail system. I think uh, that, that is a very, a very good question. And, uh, but again, uh, we're, we're with a population now, like, uh, like we know on Oahu, 950,000 people. Right. One line won't address all, everybody. Now, How can you address as well, many we're people gonna as We're going to take a break, possible. and this is a great place, okay. uh, segue, because we've talked about various elements without naming them so far, customer-driven, 
technology, artificial intelligence, and so forth. When we come back from the break, let's talk about what you've learned at Google and explicitly so that we can apply it here to Hawaii. My guest, Ray Tsuchiyama, today talking about technology and creativity as it can improve our situation in Hawaii. I'm Kei Akina on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Don't go away. We'll be right back for the rest of our fascinating conversation. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Planning all week for the day of the big game. Watching at home just doesn't feel the same. What on the list is who's going to drive. It's nice to know you're going to get home alive. Plan for fun and responsibility. Choose the DD. Captain of our team. It's the DD. For every game day, assign a designated driver. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion, nothing is making sense for me and you. Maybe we can find a way, there's got to be solution, how to make a brighter day. Welcome back to Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili'i Akina. Why do we call this program Hawaii Together? It's because when we work together, we will be able to accomplish things that we can't accomplish if we don't work together. Our vision at the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii, where I work, is building a better Hawaii through a better economy, government, and society. And the only way to do that is to work together. What I like to say, e hana kako, let's work together. My guest today is an expert at collaboration on a global scale that improves localities. And that's one of the reasons I've invited him here, because that's one of the things Hawaii needs. More than that, Ray takes from a very rich background in working in technology companies lessons that can be applied here and now. And so back to our conversation with Ray Tsuchiyama. Ray, I think the break time conversation is just as fascinating <laughs> as the on-air conversation. So I'll invite our viewers to come to the studio sometime in downtown Honolulu. But you've been going around the country and around town sharing some ideas that you learned in, in Google. And one of the first of them is this whole concept upon which hiring and advancement is based at the Google culture called meritocracy. What do you mean by meritocracy? Google believes that we all should, in any organization, that people are at the heart of, it, of the organization. But hiring has to be done blind. You have to really judge a person on his or her merits, on the background. And in fact, interviews are done by numbers. Uh, people are delivering numbers. When you talk about blind hiring, you're saying hiring is not done on the basis that someone is a brother-in-law <laughs> or a friend <laughs> yes, it's or, not, or offers uh, a bride yes, uh, or has well, no, a political no, no, but position. Familial or a friend or, or whatever. Nepotism uh, yes, uh, in well, words. trying to uh, seek the best person for the, be for the role. That, that's, that's and, and the reason these yeah. factors are excluded is precisely what you said. It's a belief that there has to be excellence in the people we hire. And also they have to score very high or at the top for working with other people in a team. And you've also seen the same thing in terms of advancement within the organization, that it's based upon meritocracy. Correct. As well. and, and, uh, and again, and, uh, how well they work uh, in, a, in a team and, and really uh, move ahead and develop the best products. Well, here in Hawaii, we have some very rich and long-standing work cultures whether they are in government, corporate world, or the unions, per se, how would you assess the, the quality of meritocracy as a factor in advancement and hiring? I think we have to really take a look at where we want to go <laughs> as a society or business or government, looking outwards. What kind of skills uh, do we need for a government of the 21st century, or a business that has to survive and compete globally, or a union that really wants to create better and more uh, higher paying jobs for younger people. I mean, those are the critical 
questions as we move ahead. This is a very progressive vision which requires an ability to think about the future and where we're going and map that into who gets hired and who stays and who, who, lo longevity. But we seem to value tenure a great deal, you know, whether we're in the university world or the union world and so forth. How can tenure, which creates some kind of value and security, work against meritocracy? Yes, you're correct uh, that uh, tenure, say, in a university uh, uh, has issues. But you know, larger universities, uh, like at um, MIT or ma many others, have a flourishing culture. But the way they hire, and it goes back to hiring, is that tenure uh, at some departments at MIT where I'm, uh, I was is like barely 20%. So that among five young professors coming in in the first year, by the third or fifth year, only one remains. And, and that's that, how challenged, uh, uh, challenging it is to remain and teach at a prestigious uh, university like MIT. That's right. You know, th that filtering process allows the best to rise to the Correct. top, which is a competitive factor. Meritocracy by its very nature is competitive. But, you know, I, I pick up here in Hawaii that that's not so much our culture. We have more of a culture of cooperation as the explicit value, kokua, let's work together, let's get along, which can easily become, I'll scratch your back if you scratch my back and so forth, which, and I use the word culture deliberately here, which creates a, a way of working here in Hawaii that actually works against excellence. Well, you're correct. Is, can a society have a higher goal? Mm -hmm. than familial or friendships. That, that's what I think you're saying. In the post-war period, there was a burst of creativity and people coming together in the late 50s and, and, and 60s based on a goal of a new state uh, you know, after 59. I think people did work together, but they saw something in the future that uh, they wanted education, uh, the public education, or UH, or uh, uh, the private sector, all uh, reaching for a higher goal. Well, in, during that period of time, there was a dream right. that was shared by a large a number of people here in the state of Hawaii, or the territory of Hawaii and right. the state of Hawaii. A dream of what we collectively could become in terms of the economy, in terms of the government, in terms of society, in terms of opportunity for everyone. It gave birth to the unions. It gave birth to the largest party that we have politically, the Democrats. Uh, there, there was so much aspiration. Do you think that the lack of aspiration today may be a reason that we settle for mediocrity rather than, than merit? Well, I think uh, it, it, if you go back in the past, uh, people look at a world that was black and white, uh, in a plantation haves and have-nots. And I think that really uh, was a propelling uh, um, uh, foundation or mythology or just drive for people to escape all that and establish a new order, a new state that was much more fair. And we reached that in the 60s and into the 70s. But uh, we didn't uh, plan out for the next level, where we're going to go as a state. And uh, remember, other states began to uh, uh, work with Asia. Other states That's began right. to uh, 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 become technologically, uh, you know, uh, 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 higher, in, in, like California and other, we, we didn't uh, uh, think uh, um, about going further. But in 1970-71, there was the Hawaii 2000 uh, yes. goal. I mean, people were thinking 30 years ahead. They were. Uh, unbelievable yeah. at that time. You know, and uh, we had leaders who cast vision. We had uh, John Burns, Dan Inouye, George Ariyoshi, kind of like JFK uh, saying, you know, ask uh, about the, the dream that we can all become. Now, there's something else that you've been talking about as you discuss the lessons from Google, and, and that is the actual work culture. You see that they hire people and sustain a work culture that is roughly half engineers, sure. the, 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 the geeks, the nerds, and, and half market development, right. the liberal arts people. Right, well, pro product, people, development, product, 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 yes. product development. Product development and so managers. forth. And that there's some kind of synergy between right. having serious hires on both sides. That's, uh, that's correct. And uh, the engineers, of course, have to be excellent engineers. Product managers have to look at anything and say, can I make this better? Can I make a pen better, a cup, or a Google Maps, or search? How, how do one make it better features for the consumer? so that the consumer really wants to use that over another. So that's why we have a product-obsessed 
culture at Google. And there seems to be a balance as well as a tension between these, these two kinds of cultures, the engineering culture and the product development culture. That's correct, and it's also a global market. Uh, uh, there are go, uh, global, uh, Google products uh, used from Africa, Latin America, Europe, uh, North America, throughout Asia Pacific. So they're looking at a global market. How do you think we can infuse that kind of synergy into our own processes, whether they be in government employment or corporate employment here in the state of Hawaii? That is from uh, creating uh, programs to really uh, develop a new leadership style. And I think there are some parts in the old Big Five, and I know this is funny to you, sure. but I work for Castle and Cook uh, also, and there was a lot of things dealing with uh, Castle and Cook that I found an like Ohana kind of spirit. But that spirit could not be sustained in the 21st century uh, uh, with, with competition and new products and so forth. So I think there has to be a program to develop a new type of leader in Hawaii that has language skills, has te technical skills, organizational skills, product skills, and the way to make uh, people work together. This goes to another point you make about the culture of Google. You say there's high expectation. The, the, the bar is set very high as to what to achieve, and people are inspired to pursue that. That's correct, and um, how um, you have the best minds in the uh, world together and to have them working together and up, uh, coming up with products of such a major, uh, I think, a revolutionary in many ways. Yeah, We products. often self-describe ourselves when talking about our large institutions here in Hawaii with, with the little uh, phrase, uh, the nail that stands up gets pounded down. Do you think there's a culture here that, that works against excellence? You know, in the past, in the territory of Hawaii, mm -hmm. I think it was the reverse. I think it, uh, public education teachers, uh, especially from uh, leading institutions from the mainland, came in and wanted to make people into the new citizen, the new statehood citizen. Uh, today, I think uh, we do not have the expectations and to infuse people that they can do great things and, and contribute to society. You know, well, um, that's a good point to stop on today, and our time has gone already. This has been so fascinating. <laughs> we, we could talk about many more <laughs> lessons to learn, and the fact that you're not saying that there's something negative about Hawaii. But indeed, if we could have another half hour with you, you'd talk about how the Kingdom of Hawaii right. actually demonstrated many of the values that Google does today in terms of moving us into a world-class uh, status. The Kingdom is far more progressive uh, compared to Japan, South Korea, and China. They were coming in a medieval age. Well, Hawaii I, was much more progressive. I hope we can recapture that. Ray, okay. great having you on the program today. Thank, Thank you very you. much. My guest today, Ray Tsuchiyama a consultant in innovation and technology, talking about how global lessons from Google can make a difference here in the state of Hawaii. I'm Keili'i Akina. You're watching Hawaii Together on the ThinkTech Hawaii Broadcast Network. We'll see you next time. Aloha.